first session today is a fireside conversation between our Director of Foresight Research here at Policy Horizons, Simon Robertson, and Thomas Homer Dixon. So let's begin. Over to you, Simon. Merci, Imran. Bonjour tout le monde. Comme Imran l'a mentionné, je suis Simon Robertson, le directeur de la recherche en prospective à Horizon de Politique Canada. Et je suis heureux d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui et il me fait plaisir de souhaiter la bienvenue à Thomas Homer Dixon. Our fireside chat today is about examining the poly crisis and what it could mean for society, governments, and the future. Thomas Homer Dixon is the founder and director of the Cascade Institute at Royal Roads University, one of, one of the best informed and most brilliant writers on global affairs today, according to The Guardian. He is considered among the world's leading experts on the intricate links between nature, technology, and society. He's also a best-selling author. His latest book is entitled Commanding Hope. Welcome, Thomas Homer Dixon. Thank you for joining us. It's wonderful to be with you here today. So the subject of today's conversation is polycrisis. Now, some of you may not know what that is, but we're all here to learn about it together. Thomas, it is part of the work that you lead at the Cascade Institute and that you led before joining the Institute. Polycrisis is a term that describes the collision of crises in the 21st century. So for our audience, can you briefly define polycrisis? Sure. In some sense, it simply means that there's a lot of bad stuff happening simultaneously around the world and this sense that a whole bunch of things are going wrong. You might think of it as a kind of perfect storm of crises. We have a war in Europe, we have inflation, we have declining democracy, rising political authoritarianism, uh, a pandemic that we're just emerging from. Uh, but really, the concept means more than that. And the way we define it within the Cascade Institute is that it consists of three or more systemic risks, such as uh, economic strain or climate change, uh, that are combining in ways to produce harms that are more than any one of those individual risks would produce by themselves. So the key idea here is that there is a, 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 a novelty to the to the combination of all the crises together that magnifies the harm involved. And I think most people have a sense that that's what's happening. It's more than just the bits and pieces, the, the inflation and the war and the pandemic and other things. It's that it's all happening together that's really uh, overwhelming our institutions and kind of um, producing a very scary environment. So there's been there's been some recent controversy um, about this idea of polycrisis, and in a recent Globe and Mail article titled "Dismissing the Term Polycrisis Has One Inevitable Consequence: Reality Always Bites," you stated, "Today, though, the past isn't a good guide to our present and future." So that statement really resonates with me, and it resonates well with foresight. Indeed, the past is not always the best guide to the future. But with that in mind. What is new in the polycrisis, and why is it important to consider the polycrisis when looking at the future? Sure. So this is a really fundamental question. Is, is this just history repeating itself, as somebody like Neil Ferguson would say, the well-known uh, historian? He made that claim at the January World Economic Forum meeting. He said the polycrisis is an illusion. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's nothing really new here. Or is there something fundamentally new? So at the Cascade Institute, uh, we argue that the world is fundamentally different than it was before in a whole bunch of ways that maybe aren't entirely recognized because there are slow processes that we call stresses that evolve over time and you don't actually see the, the evolution. But if you compare over a period of decades, things are very different. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, normally, the amount of heat coming into the surface of the Earth from the sun and the amount going back out to space that's radiated back out to space is in perfect balance, almost perfect balance. But because of the amount of carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases humankind has added to the atmosphere, the, the Earth is out of radiative balance by about a, a watt per square meter across the surface of the planet. That doesn't sound like much. But it's when you add it up across the entire surface of the planet, it's an enormous amount of energy, equivalent to roughly 600,000 Hiroshima bombs exploded in the atmosphere every day. That amount of energy being inputted into the ocean atmospheric system every day because of this radiative imbalance. 
that's entirely new. That's something that humankind has never experienced before. And of course, it's producing climate change and extreme weather events all over the planet that are fundamentally new too. Another example would be uh, the, the fact that uh, because of human population growth, the sheer biomass of the human population exceeds pretty well any other single species on the planet except cows. So, so uh, agricultural crop, essentially uh, livestock that we have produced as a species is the only other species that has more biomass on the planet than us. Uh, uh, it used to be that krill around the Antarctic uh, were in total a species that <laughs> consisted of more biomass in total. Uh, but since we've overfished krill and the human population has grown, we're now ranked number two in the world. So why does that matter? It matters because uh, we are essentially a monocrop on the planet, which means we are very vulnerable to pathogens that can spread very rapidly between the connected this connected biomass. It's like a massive petri dish of genetically identical material on the surface of the planet. And of course, much more vulnerable to things like pandemics as a result. So, so that's a characteristic of the human population. That biomass has doubled in the last 70 years or so as the population has doubled and it's made us more vulnerable to pandemics. And a, a final example would be on the technological side. Uh, uh, in the last 30 years or so, the cost of producing and distributing information has fallen to essentially zero. Uh, which in many ways is a good thing, but it's also produced a whole series of consequences in terms of information overload and uh, and uh, various kinds of truth bubbles because there's so much information available, people can select what they want to hear. That has actually eroded in some ways our social cohesion. So there are just three examples, climate heating, biomass, and information cost of, that show just how fundamentally different our our world is than it was, say, half a century ago. Yeah, certainly. In, in listening to you, I'm hearing a very persuasive case for the novelty of our current situation with you know so many crises emerging or well underway in so many important areas. I'm hoping that you could go a little bit deeper and help us understand the mechanisms that can turn multiple distinct crises into a multi-system global crisis. So what is the role of intersystemic connections in this process? Well, the connections, of course, are fundamentally important because they they allow the the uh, sort of causal transmission of these stresses through the system. At the Cascade Institute, we make a fundamental distinction between what we call stresses and triggers. So I've mentioned some of these stresses, including the change in the radiative balance, the demographic change of the human population, the cost of information. There are a bunch of them, a dozen, 15 that people identify. And these tend to move fairly slowly. They have a fairly predictable trajectory. They can be modeled over time. Uh, but they don't actually produce the crisis themselves. You need the stress in combination with a trigger event, which could be uh, something like a bankruptcy or an assassination or a drought in a particular region that affects food supply. And then the trigger combines with the stresses to produce a crisis, to knock a, a, a global system like a, the economy or our health systems from one stable state into another state that may be not, not very beneficial. So notice that you've got these more predictable processes, which you can call stresses, and you've got triggers, which are largely stochastic and random and that you can't predict. We tend to focus on the trigger stuff and not paying so much attention to these slow processes that change over time, which we call stresses. Now, those stresses uh, are, are uh, we believe, uh, amplifying, accelerating, and the crises they're producing are synchronizing. So let me just talk about those three things for a moment. Uh, amplification simply means that they're getting worse over time. So for instance, with climate heating uh, around the year 2000, if you compared the, the tropospheric, the temperature of the surface of the earth uh, at that point to pre-industrial temperatures, it, it was around 0 0.72 degrees warmer. Now we're 20 years later, we're at 1.2 degrees warmer than pre-industrial temperatures. So that's an increase in the severity, kind of an amplification of the of the seriousness of the problem of climate heating. It's also accelerated climate heating. So if you look at the warming per decade between 1970 and 2010, 
the warming per decade was about 0.18 degrees. It looks like we've accelerated in the period from 2010 out towards 2040, if you predict forward, that the warming per decade has accelerated to about uh, 0.27 degrees per decade. So that's a 50% increase in the rate of change. It's what a statistician would call a change in the second derivative. Uh, so there's an acceleration of climate change. If you look at most of these stresses, they're all accelerating. And then the final thing, and this is where we get to the issue of connectivity in the system, we believe at the Cascade Institute that these, uh, these stresses and the crises they're producing are synchronizing in a way. So we've got amplification of the problems, acceleration, and synchronization. We think they're synchronizing because to, there, are, there are connections between these stresses that are causing them to all sort of tip in a negative direction simultaneously. Uh, and we don't fully understand these connections effectively. We need to have a much better grasp of how things are influencing each other, the feedback loops in the system. And that those are some of the things that we're trying to unpack within the Cascade Institute right now. Um, honestly, the, the nub of the polycrisis problem is this issue of synchronization. Why is it that so much stuff seems to be going in a negative direction simultaneously? We don't believe this is just coincidence. We believe that there are many connections in the background, many of which aren't seen that we need to understand better. I find this to be such an interesting observation. And um, my takeaway from it is that this, this knowledge can be quite valuable to anyone in the audience who works uh, with policies or with programs. And uh, particularly for anyone here in our, in our audience at Futures Week who works with complex systems or whose work is impacted by by complex systems. So, I, with that in mind, um, I've I've also heard you talk about what are what are, what you refer to as high leverage intervention points. Could you explain for us what that means, and in relation to that concept, what society and leaders, including governments, policymakers, private organizations, people at large, can do to best prepare for the future? Well, this is in, in, in many ways the most fundamental question, right? It, 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 it's useful, as I was suggesting, to have a better understanding of the system and, and the causation in the background that sort of, or maybe better to think the con causation underneath the surface, subliminal causation that we're not seeing right now. We need to unpack that, but that's a diagnostic exercise. Ultimately, we want to try to change the trajectory. Now, one of the things that complex system specialists will say is that is that we are living in in a fundamentally nonlinear world and a, that's a complex systems concept that needs to be unpacked a bit it means basically that there's a, a breakdown in what we conventionally understand as the relationship between cause and effect yep. normally uh we would uh, think that small causes cause small effects and big causes called cause big effects. Uh, but in our nonlinear world, sometimes small causes can cause really big changes and big causes can cause, uh, I'm not sure if I'm muted or not. I just got to, okay, we are in a session, good. Uh, so sometimes big causes can cause very little change at all. In this nonlinear world, uh, policy becomes really difficult. We're in a situation of extraordinary uncertainty. So one of the things we need to do is we need to understand where the potential intervention points are in these systems, because we can play that nonlinearity potentially to our benefit. We can, we can uh, uh, look for the places where we can leverage that disproportionality of causation, look for places where relatively small interventions will produce really big changes. But the very first step is for us to have a better system that's understanding of the system. The very first step is for us to, uh, to identify where those leverage points might be. Uh, and one of the fundamental obstacles to doing this effectively is that within our scientific disciplines and within our institutional arrangements, for instance, within the, the ministries of governments around the world, problems tend to be divided up and siloed into their individual categories. Uh, so we have we have a, a ministry that focuses on climate change. We have another one that focuses on health. We have one that deals with the economy. And while everybody now understands that this is stuff is all interlinked together, there are practical considerations that interfere with the accumulation of knowledge to identify where those leverage points might be. 
Among other things, it's just really hard for any one of us to hold all of that information in our heads simultaneously. And, uh, and, and, and then just to create the communication between organizations and ministries that operate with different paradigms, different kinds of languages, different sets of principles and understandings of the world. So there's a, a fundamental need to integrate knowledge across these silo boundaries. Uh, we believe all of this is possible at the Cascade Institute. We are developing tools that allow us to track the interconnections between systems, between economic and environmental and social and political and technological systems. Um, and um, we're also very impressed by the work at, at, uh, at Policy Horizons Canada, uh, really a, a group of people who are leading the way in many respects in the world with, with this kind of analysis. So it's possible to do better, uh, but the problems at the moment are currently outracing us. The poly crisis is currently outracing us. Uh, so we have to implement these new tools of understanding faster than, than we have to date. Thank you for that. That's uh, uh, really helpful. And I think uh, something that uh, a lot of us here who, who are participating uh, can, can take into the work that we do. With that in mind, can you give us maybe an example of a high intervention, uh, high intervention points that uh, might be important for a resilient future? Well, you know, if there are two ways of approaching this problem or thinking about these things, we can think in terms of dominoes or loops. Those are two metaphors. So the domino problems are ones where you have kind of cascading failure, like a bunch of dominoes falling over. Uh, what we saw coming out of the Ukraine-Russia war with, for instance, impacts on the food system, impacts on inflation would be an example. Um, and, and we recognized there was a, there's a pretty good understanding of, of how to respond. We recognized early on that it was important to get in and fix the food problem, to get those boats out of, out of the ports in Ukraine with grain on them. Uh, otherwise, we were going to have a global food crisis. So that was a critical intervention point. It was recognized and acted upon. But there are loop problems, which are not as well understood. So an example very quickly would be that we're in a world of deglobalization. The deglobalization is undermining economic development in many uh, poor countries. That's increasing migration. And the migrant migrants arriving at the borders of, of richer countries are actually producing a resistance to more globalization within a political resistance, a kind of nationalistic backlash, which reinforces the deglobalization problem. Now, that's a much more pernicious kind of self-reinforcing loop. And intervening in that can be more difficult, but is ultimately probably more important uh, if we're going to reduce the polycrisis problems in the future. Excellent. Thanks. That's a great, some great examples for us. And thank you, Thomas, for uh, being here with us today. It's been great sitting down with you. And I think it's provided us with an insightful and progressive way to look at future crisis. And this is precisely what Futures Week is all about, opening minds, thinking in different ways, uh, raising concepts that may be new or even challenging, and thinking through some of these considerations and implications. And I know I certainly have a lot to think about, and I hope everyone here tuning in does as well.